any happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Hey, meatheads. David here. As I've said in the past, I'm sending out all my love, respect, and patience to the retail butchers of the world during their particular culture's holiday season. Because no matter what we're celebrating or not celebrating, uh, it means one universal thing for all of us, and that happens to be extra customer service. A lot of which is coming from people who are buying outside of their comfort zones. You know, um, larger quantities, different species, recipes they've never tried, hosting people, the extra pressure of that. Uh, all of these things come together to, you know, there's like an underlying current of, of uh, anxiety throughout the season. So here's to you people, you know. All the best of luck and strength uh, over the next year. Take care of yourselves and one another in the shop. Get lots of sleep and don't even attempt to show up hungover. No matter what your lizard brain tells you to do at midnight, it's just not even close to worth it, trust me. Inevitably, you know, after the dust has settled, uh, particularly after Thanksgiving in the States, small shops, large shops, retail, corporate, whatever. Um, there's forgotten customer orders of, say, beef, lamb, and pork middle meats, as well as, like, your standard mountain of unsold poultry and hams. Um, a lot of perishable things. So what the hell do you do with all this product? I've seen this dealt with in a number of ways, I think, depending... Um, on what your facilities are and what your inspection status is, you can get more or less done and have more or less creativity. When I worked for the nation's largest certified organic grocer, uh, we had a prepared foods department. So this was a total win for us because we'd sell it to the department. They'd have items, you know, that would come in on the cheap for their hot bar, um, of course, we'd stake out the pork, lamb, and beef metals, and that'd be no problem. Uh, it was really the hams and the poultry that needed to be upcycled into some sort of value-added product. And that's what the prep foods department did for us, you know. Um, it did mean that there was going to be barbecued turkey thighs and wings for the next four to five months. And there'd be a lot of weird-looking mom casseroles uh, on the hot bar, but it, it really worked out. In the smaller shop that I worked at in Seattle, Black Friday was basically spent boning up birds. Ducks, definitely. Maybe a goose or two. Chicken and turkey. And then those would go to sausage or confit or something like that. Uh, from a production standpoint, it was a win because it was a unique product that we didn't usually have. It was generally looked really nice. Uh, it was creative. It was a conversation starter, you know, um, one that we did was like a duck sausage with cranberry currants, mint, oregano, rosemary, star anise, clove, stuff like that. And people always asked about it. It was easy to sell. But you couldn't really sell all of it, though. That's the thing. You've got these birds that have already got two or three days on them. Put them into a fresh sausage. You know, the salt definitely makes it go a little bit longer, but uh, it's only as good as its appearance, and it will start to oxidize. So, uh that's not the perfect solution. And sometimes I find myself feeling a little discouraged or even mildly panicked during the days after a food-centric holiday because there was always a shit ton of food traffic, or a, a foot traffic, rather, um, or food traffic. But there weren't a lot of buyers. And, you know, what I saw these people having in common was this, like, subtle look that came over their face that basically said, this shit looks delicious, but... No way am I cooking tonight, tomorrow, the next day, or the day after that. And I get it. You know? After making a huge holiday meal, especially if you host it, I want nothing to do with being in that kitchen. I want things that I can just pop in the oven, like, you know, a frozen shepherd's pie that I've just had in a tin in the freezer, just ready for the oven, or like a meatloaf, or whatever, you know? And, and so... I know that's how I feel. I know that probably um, as a person that loves to cook, maybe the average consumer feels even more averse to cooking. So what can we do about this? Uh, we've got to make it easy, super, super easy, like dorm room easy. 
So we here down at the Meat Block Labs uh, have come up with some different ideas that uh, we've tried and have been successful and, and maybe you guys could try uh, if you're stumped or if you're looking for a new idea or some way to upcycle all these poultry leftovers. So first of all, you know you're going to sell X amount of special brat size fresh link. Um, I'd start by boning out whatever bird parts you're longest on and make that much curry worse with it, you know. I highly recommend grinding um, your poultry trim with a pork back fat so you can give the link at least, you know, a fighting chance of being good. I like to do a 20% a 20 ratio of fat to bird muscle if it's mostly to bone leg quarter. Um, but if it's mostly breast meat or if it's just like a, an even mix, 25 27% uh, hog back fat, you know, by weight is, is going to give you a better product in the end. If you have to be all poultry, just, you know, use the same amount of meat weight, leave out the fat. Um, but I highly suggest doing the poultry and the pork. So just as a general method, I cube up my back fat. Uh, I mix by hand with the trim, and I get it super cold, like 34 degrees. Um, while that's, you know, chilling or freezing or whatever, make sure you have uh, chipped ice or ice water on hand about 3% of the total weight of the meat and fat mix. 3% is the total amount that the USDA allows of water um, to be added to a fresh ground product without being listed as an ingredient. And honestly, it isn't like a thumb on the scale thing. It's about texture and the water, in my opinion, is necessary. It's not my, it's not my opinion. The water is necessary for proper emulsification. So uh, you're going to grind the meat eventually through a 3 16 or 5 millimeter plate and put it back in the chill box or, or fridge or walk-in uh, while you prepare your dry ingredients. And don't clean your grinder yet because once everything's rested and meat, you know, uh, kitted up, we'll be using it again. Obviously, this is an ideal situation and you can amend this process to fit your production needs, uh, but this is kind of an idealized situation. Um, here's an extra little effort that I take in order to promote moisture retention in a poultry sausage. So, I mean, this, this could work for like any sausage, but especially poultry, um, because it needs every, every little bit of help it can get. So I salt my trim in the mixer grinder or in just like a lugger by hand, uh, just prior to grinding it for the first time. Then if time affords it, I'll let the meat rest for two to four hours before seasoning and grinding a second or third time or even, you know, using the bowl chopper. Um, my experience is that this process helps with emulsification. I think that it maybe begins to denature the proteins and uh, allows for um, more efficient protein extraction. And you just end up with a better texture and a, a better end product, something that's able to retain moisture more properly. Um, so once you salted and then ground your pork bird mix, um, and it's resting for the minimum of two hours, you're going to gather and kit up the rest of the recipe from the following ingredients. Okay. Here's my recipe. Four pounds of boneless poultry could be a mix. Maybe it's, you know, put it on the pizza, man. Maybe it's just whatever, whatever you got. Uh, one pound of pork back fat cubed. And 48 grams of salt, which you'll, you'll season the trim with right away and then grind it uh, so you can let it rest. Um, 30 grams of black pepper, 30 grams of fresh ginger, 45 grams of garam masala, uh, 35 grams of yellow curry powder, 45 grams of fresh minced garlic, uh, 40 grams of dried thyme, one tablespoon of lemon zest, 150 grams of fine diced onion, three quarter cup of chopped parsley, and your 3% ice. Take your onions and garlic, get them in a, a super fine dice, or even better yet, realistically, put them in your food processor and just zip them up into it. Not quite a puree, but like a pretty fine mince. Um, and that'll go really well. So once you've got all of those ingredients kitted up, you've got your uh, fresh garlic 
and ginger and onion spun up in your food processor or mince super fine. Add your meat block back to the mixer grinder. Set it just to mix. Slowly add your spices, uh, the fresh veg, the ice or the ice water together and let it mix. Let it get nice and integrated, nice and homogenized. Uh, and then once thoroughly, thoroughly combined, grind that through the 316th or 5 millimeter plate again. Um, in my opinion, I would, I would rather see the texture of this particular sausage be more like a uh, vice first or something highly emulsified, almost like a mortadella texture, you know, um, or like a Bockwurst or something. But it's not necessary. Also, a, a more coarse grind, I think, is really good. Not not super coarse, but relatively coarse to like a highly emulsified product. So uh, uh, the finer the coarse, the better. The, the finer the grind, the better. Um, I just wanted to make it accessible to kind of a minimal setup. Um, and that's, that's really what you're after with that sausage. And I think a variation is that if, if you were able to get it highly emulsified, like a mortadella farce or um, a bakwurst farce, I think if you were to be able to pre-poach this and then sell it, you know, as a parboiled uh, sausage, essentially would be fully cooked, I, I think it would look really nice in the case, and I think it would be even more attractive attractive to the consumer. Another, let's see, um, another one that we would do in the shop, which it probably sounds kind of crazy, but I don't know, like usually during the holidays, there, there's some years where I want nothing to do with standard American Thanksgiving fare. You know, I want like on Christmas morning, I want uh, anything but American food ultimately is what is what I'm getting at. And um I've had success like on Black Friday and that weekend afterwards with turkey pho broth. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, pho is a wildly delicious, flavorful, and special Vietnamese soup that comes with noodles and fresh vegetables and herbs and um, peppers. And it's, it's just, it'll cure what ails you, no matter what that is. And... Um, you know, I've, I've made some paltry attempts at making something that would work for a pho broth and it's, it's turned out pretty well and, uh, flavor wise anyways. And I think that if you can pint that up and sell it, whether it's with a kit or not, I mean, you could assemble a full kit, uh, which would include various, you know, fixings to put in this hot broth, especially with meat. You know, like a, uh, a, a razor thin, like a shabu shabu style, um, eye of round or uh, top round, something like that, you know, would be really nice. Anyways, uh, get this kit together or just the pints of the stuff and sell it at a fixed price. And it's, it's pretty popular. So um, the idea is the customer takes the broth home, they heat it up super hot, they get their fresh ingredients, bean sprouts and jalapeno peppers and fresh basil and, you know, whatever else you want to throw in there in your kit. And then some some noodles, some rice noodles, some really, you know, minute and a half boiling things. Put the, you know, the, the customer brings this broth up to temp and they throw the items in in their bowl and they serve it and it's delicious and hot and, and soul food, you know, so... um Here's my recipe for this. Inevitably, from the boning out process for the uh, curry worst, you've got a bunch of bones. So go ahead and roast those. Let's let's take five pounds of darkly roasted bones. Not like burned. Do them low and slow, but get them like really, really rich. And then uh, five to seven pounds of turkey parts or, or whole chicken or whatever poultry you want to use. Uh, you're going to put those in a deep hotel pan. Now, this is all assuming that you've got an oven in your shop or prepared foods department does, or somehow you can replicate this. I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I'm sorry. Not sorry. You're going to take those roasted bones, the the poultry parts, you're going to put them in the deep hotel pan with any, I mean, if you've got any beef or pork knuckles lying around the shop, any anything with collagen, go ahead and toss those in there. Put them on the pizza. Uh... 
and then you're going to add your aromatics to this. Okay, you're going to put a half a head of garlic, uh, four chopped onions, uh, half a head of celery, maybe a half a bunch of fresh parsley, um, one and a half cups of white wine, herb stems, black peppercorns, a half a pound of carrots, and two bay leaves. Throw those in there with those with those uh, poultry parts. Cover it up three quarters of the way with water. Put foil on it. Throw it in the oven at two hundred and ten degrees, two hundred and five degrees, where, wherever you can get right there, and and put it in there overnight. Just let it go, and it'll be perfect the next morning. Come in for the next shift, uh, twelve hours later, whatever it may be. Take it out. Let it cool at room temp until it's tepid, and then strain it through uh, um, china cap style, like large colander, into a cambro, and from there, um, we'll we'll divide it up. So, all of the all of the chicken parts and and all of the solids that you've re- retained, you're gonna have that in your colander, and you're gonna separate the meat from the bones. So be very very careful not to include any small bones, um, but if you're working carefully and intentionally, you can do that. So, you're gonna separate all the meat. You're gonna set that off to the side. If you see any garlic cloves still intact, throw those in with the meat. Those will be delicious. Other than that, uh, discard the rest of the solids. From there, take a third of your total broth and set it off to the side. If you have an induction burner or a hot plate, I would put that into uh, that one third of the broth that you've separated into a pot and start to reduce that by a minimum 50%, um, and we'll come back to that later. The remaining broth, you're going to put back in the hotel pan, and you're going to throw in uh, a couple star anise pods, uh, couple clove, some coriander, um, any other seasonings that you think that would go really well with that cinnamon stick, and you're going to let that steep back in the warm oven for another couple hours. Now, once that comes back out of the oven, that's ready to cool. And once you cool that, you can pint that up, and that'll be your pho broth. You can assemble your kits. You can sell those as kind of a ready, oven-ready dinner. Now, the meat is going to be off to the side, and that's going to go into a terrine that we're going to put together. Kind of a, a, a rustic, uh, loose and fast sort of terrine. That one-third of the broth that we drained off of the solids that you reserved, we're going to put that on the hot plate and bring it up to a boil and reduce that because that's going to be our aspic. That's going to be our binder, our uh, gelatinous kind of... Um, binding agent in the terrine. So bring that up to a boil and reduce it until it, you know, effectively coats the back of a spoon with kind of a sticky, sweet, roasted tasting uh, syrup almost. In the meantime, uh, I'd suggest preparing a seasoning for the warm shredded meat that came off the bones from the stock. So one that I've done in the past that I think is really good. I mean, you could really season this with anything. Whatever you've got around the shop, you could come up with the flavor profile and make it work. I mean, for Christ's sakes, it could be like sriracha blue cheese. It, I mean, don't do that because that will be terrible. But it could be anything, you know. And so one that I've done in the past, uh, we had dry, some dried figs, uh, sautéed shallots, some garlic, and some oil-cured back, black olives. Uh, we had those for other shit, you know, and, and we used it. So... um I added some lemon, some parsley, some fresh oregano, some rosemary, and a little bit of uh, like a pickled pepper, kind of like a Mama Lil's pickled goat horn pepper, if you've ever had that. It's a really, really great pickled pepper. But, you you know, really you can season with whatever's in abundance at the shop. Keep in mind, this is a super rustic loaf, and it's meant to be served on a sandwich. Like, it's not, this is not the crown jewel of a charcuterie case. Uh, however, this method could be easily adapted for that presentation or format or whatever, you know. Uh, so basically what you'll do is you'll get your seasoning together. You'll mix it with that warm meat. And when the aspect is reduced to the point where it can coat the back of the spoon, and it's very, you know, quite sticky, uh, you'll pour that aspect over the warm seasoned meat and you'll mix it up really well and then put it into the tree. And then the tree I like to line with uh, cling wrap. 
I mean, you could really do any inlay, but I think plain wrap is the easiest because then you can pull it out and, and uh, have a nice, easy to remove loaf, you know. Um, and so you'll line your tureen, your bread pan, whatever it may be with uh, cling wrap, pour the hot aspic and, and seasoned meat mix into that, wrap it up with uh, plastic on the top, and then let it sit in the fridge for 24 hours, you know, minimum 12. It'll take a while to set, but once it does, it'll be very sliceable. Uh, the meat will be tender, everything, and it will be, will be well seasoned and tender. And um, it's really great on a sandwich with some pickles and some mayonnaise or some some uh, sharp whole grain mustard or something it's killer so you know that's another thing you could you could sell it that way pre-sliced or or something like that um those are just a, a few ideas if you have any favorite value-added products after your local holiday uh you know send it our way drop us a line at, at the meat block instagram and we can share it with the rest of the meatheads out there all right otherwise happy holidays